processional hymn can be found in your pew missile at number 232. Praise to the Lord, it's number 232. <laughs> Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done, what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.
Let us pray. O God, who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light, grant we pray that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. For he fashioned all things that they might have being, and the creatures of the world are wholesome, and there is not a destructive drug among them, nor any domain of the netherworld on earth, for justice is undying. For God formed man to be imperishable. The image of his own nature he made him. But by the envy of the devil, death entered the world. And they who belong to his company experience it. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, as you excel in every respect, in faith, discourse, knowledge, all earnestness, and in the love we have for you, may you excel in this gracious act also. For you know the gracious act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Nor that others should have relief while you are burdened, but that as a matter of equality, 
your abundance at the present time should supply their needs so that their abundance may also supply your needs, that there may be equality. As it is written, whoever had much did not have more, and whoever had little did not have less. The word of the Lord. According to Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. He went off with him and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet she was not helped but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to Jesus, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid. Just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a child of 12, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were utterly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. How's everyone? 
But the gospel that we have for today is really one of the most beautiful sets of miracles that we hear of in Jesus' is um, in the gospel of St. Mark, but in all the gospels. And one of the ways it comes alive so powerfully is the way in which St. Mark relates the story in telling us basically from the memory of St. Peter. St. Mark, you remember, was St. Peter's interpreter for putting the gospel that he preached down into writing and putting down all of his memories. But one of the things with this is so beautiful, the different, the parallels that take place in an event that actually happened. But as St. Mark puts it all to his pen, he begins showing us the beauty of the way in which the Lord works when he heals people. But it's not just beautiful. It, we also hear in this gospel, one of the most tender miracles that Jesus performs, the raising of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead. And for the homily today, I'm just going to kind of retell the story, and I want you to try and put yourself in the shoes of all these characters in the, in the gospel, of Jairus, the father of this 12-year-old daughter, the mother, the people in the crowds, the apostles, all of them. Put yourselves in their shoes and feel what's going on. So all of this, as we just heard, starts when Jesus is there right on the Sea of Galilee. And it's almost like as he's there, he's being pushed into the water. He's being pushed into the water because of how great the crowd is that's following him around. And this would happen to Jesus often. The crowds weren't like his. Sometimes you see in paintings, the crowds are sitting nice and they're behaving nice and everyone's looking piously, looking, you know, all struck and everything. But it was actually a lot more chaotic than that. There were times where they were afraid that, as, especially now as we hear as they're walking, that the crowds were pushing upon one another that they were going to get killed because of how strong the crowds were and how many people that were there. There are times where Jesus almost did get pushed into the water that he saw a boat there and said, bring that boat. I'm getting in that boat so they can't drown me in the water. Water, basically. That's what these kinds of crowds like. It's not like the way Americans line up for something. <laughs> it's more like the way Italians line up for something, right? <laughs> it's a free-for-all. <laughs> it's whoever is first, and however you get first is first. That's how it works. It's the same way with these crowds that are gathering around Jesus during his time. It wasn't just a nice orderly line. It was a free-for-all to get to him. And that's what you see is happening in this gospel. But one of the things that may be happening is we hear about a man who goes up to Jesus, gets through the crowd and past the, all the sandy beaches, right there to the shore as the water meets the beach where Jesus is standing. And it could be possible because of his position that he occupied in the community as the head of the synagogue, one of the leaders of the synagogue who would have provided financially for the synagogue, overseen the different services, not, not running them probably, but basically financing them and handling the management of everything. It may have been the case that one, the people saw him and knew him of his position of authority and let him go through. He had a position amongst them, but second, it may very well have been the case that they also knew exactly what was going on in his family at the time, and that they knew amongst anyone there, this man was in desperation and needed a miracle from Jesus, needed to be able to present his petition to Jesus, and so they part the waves and let him through. Either way, even if that wasn't the case, the man that we hear of Jairus is a man in desperation. It's his 12-year-old daughter is dying. He knows he, he's run out of everything, just like the woman who was hemorrhaging in the gospel, who spent all of her resources for 12 years in trying to find some cure for what she had. He's in desperation that he runs as this is his last effort, his last possible chance of doing something to save the life of his daughter, because he's basically already been given the news, it's the end, there's nothing else that we can do for her. Imagine that sinking in, not just for anyone, for her parent or something, it's for his own daughter. Things aren't supposed to be this way for him. It should be the other way around in their life. So he's moving through this crowd with a desperation so that if he can't get through someone, he's going to get through them. He'll push them out of the way to get to Jesus. And he gets to Jesus. And the moment he gets to Jesus, all the energy and adrenaline of that moment, it brings him to his knees. His knees. He's there presenting his case to Jesus with everything he has. Jesus has to do something for him. That's how he approaches him. His daughter is sick at the point of death, and he's desperate to save the life of her. He's heard about Jesus and what he could do, and he thinks possibly, this could possibly be it. And Jesus agrees. 
He begins to go with him from the sand, the sand of the beaches back into town to the house in which this man's man lived and where his daughter was dying in that moment. And as they're going, we hear a miracle. That miracle, Jairus would have been right next to Jesus to have seen that and heard the commotion in the crowd and hear this woman who was here healed. And it probably in that moment began to lift up his spirits. There's hope. He really can heal people. It's not just the reports that I've heard that are true. I'm now seeing it with my own eyes. All of that, it begins to rising up, raise, rise up within him. But then what happens? A servant from his household, a messenger comes and tells him, sorry, you're too late. She's dead. Don't bother him anymore. It's a waste of his time. Everything in him that was rising, all that hope is now thrown down even more harder onto the ground. And it was probably even more painful. Before that, he had the distant hope of possibly Jesus who might be able to do something. Now he's seeing he can do something. All I need to do is get him home. And he tells him, it's over. She's dead. Give up. You can imagine Jesus, Jairus' heart sinking when he hears these, this news. But Jesus tells him, basically dismissing the man, don't look at him. Don't pay attention to what he's telling you. Look right at me. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Jesus continues with him to the house, and when the, they arrive at the house, it wasn't another scene of nice peace, tranquility, and calm. It was a chaos like the crowd because of the way in which people would wail, would mourn the death of a loved one at that time. It would involve a couple of things. They would wail and scream at the top of their lungs. It was a part of their ritual. You can still even hear it today, the way in which in the Middle East they had a particular way of mourning someone. It's still done today in the way that they would scream, and it was almost like people were trained in it within that culture. Not only would they wail and scream, though, that we would begin tearing their hair out. They'd have clumps of hair in their hand because of how distraught they were at this. It was like something was being, their life was being torn from them as this person had just been lost. And they would rip their clothes. They called it the rending of the garments. And they even, it was so common amongst them that there was a kind of ritual of the way you would do it, of how you would rip your clothes, where you would do it. But it was basically, it expressed all these signs, the distress that they experienced in that moment, that it really was like their heart, hearts had been ripped and torn in two. And they'd wear those torn clothes for a month so that everyone around them that they would meet for a month long, it was like you couldn't go up and approach them and say, you know, good morning, how you doing, and have a great time. You knew it was going to be a difficult conversation approaching that person. They were in the stages of mourning. It's a similar practice in some cultures that we know today, wearing black in, cult in cultures, right? During a period of mourning. This is the scene that Jesus walks in on, screaming, the tearing of garments, and the ripping of hair. He walks in, and he sees all of them, and he asks them, why all this commotion? Why are they acting like this? Haven't they, his words, basically, in the text beneath what he's saying, his implication is, don't you know what I can do? Didn't you know that he was coming to get me, to bring me here? He walks in, and he tells them, this little girl is sleeping. She's not dead. No, she really is dead. But the implication of his words is, she's not so far gone that I can't reach her. The power that I have is like waking someone from sleep. That's how close she is to us, how, how, closely I can, how quickly I can bring her back to us. And they ridicule him. They laugh at him. They laugh in his face. Even though they've heard reports of this, they begin ridiculing him. And that he, he won't stand for. He's about to perform this for this man and his wife. And he won't allow them to stay in the house. So just like the messenger, he throws them out. He turns the direction of the gaze of the mother and father away from them. He throws out all the wailers, the hair rippers, and the clothes tearers. And what happens in the house in that moment? You have silence again. There is commotion, chaos, and noise, a raucous noise. There's silence again. So much so that you can almost hear the silence 
of this little girl lying lifeless and breathless. And he walks into the house with just three of the apostles. He leaves the whole crowd outside. He takes Peter, James, and John, and this little girl's mother and father. And there we see Jesus' incredible tenderness toward children. He walks into the room in which she's laying, gets close to her, takes her little hand in his, holds it in his hand, and whispers to her, Talitha kum, little girl, arise. And the little girl opens her eyes, takes a breath again for the first time, and begins sitting up, probably startled in that moment, looking up around her at her mother and father, who she didn't, her father, who she didn't see when she took her last breath and closed her eyes for the last time before this. She sees him again around him. She feels freed from the illness that she was suffering from, free to move, that she gets up and walks around and moves around like a little kid who can jump around again for joy because of what's just happening, happened to her. And Jesus, in a tender, fatherly way, looks at her, and he knows children. He tells her she's hungry. Get her something to eat, because children are always hungry, right? They always want a snack here, then, and later, especially during a journey, after a journey, and before a journey. They want a snack. It's the same thing with this little girl. Jesus knows her well, and he shows his tenderness in this moment. Not only does he care about performing the greater miracle of raising her back from the dead, but he wants her to be fed. He's concerned for her hunger and her thirst in that moment. The tenderness and kindness and the emotion of this scene obviously struck St. Peter to the heart. You know, Jesus performed more miracles than are recorded in the Gospels. The writers and the apostles had to pick and choose what they would focus upon when they would preach the Gospel about Jesus. This scene stuck out to them. They couldn't, any time they told the story and the life of Jesus, it had to be told this way. St. Mark is recording how impressionable this moment was for St. Peter. And he tells us this in a particular way. There's some stories in the Gospel where the Gospels are originally written in Greek, but every now and then you hear the Gospel writers telling us a phrase or word of Jesus in Aramaic, and then they'll translate it for the audience that doesn't speak, the original Greek audience that doesn't speak Aramaic. What they're doing in that moment is they're basically saying, it was so incredible to hear Jesus' words of what they were spoken like originally. I have to tell you what it was like to hear. This is what it was like to hear him raise that little girl from the dead, Talitha Kum. It was one of the most beautiful things we'd ever heard. All this shows us that this scene greatly moved and influenced St. Peter. This tenderness that Jesus has toward children the way he spoke about them. It was a lesson they had to learn too, because sometimes they could be a little gruff with children. There was a time where they thought Jesus was bothered by children, so they were trying to keep the children away from Jesus, and Jesus had to reprimand them. It was a lesson that really imprinted itself upon St. Peter. Look how tender he was. Look how caring he was towards them. Not only in his awesome power over life and death, but his kindness and his compassion and his affection for them. You know, Jesus told us elsewhere in the gospel to be like children, and he had multiple reasons for it, but one of them, after this gospel, is this. He wants us to be like little children so that he can treat us in the same way as he treated this little girl. He wants to reach out and take hold of our hands and raise us up from the deaths and sufferings and illnesses and difficulties and pains that we experience. So let him reach out and take hold of your hand and raise you up. He already began to do so, he, do so on the day of our baptism. He already has his hand in ours when he raised all of us to the waters of salvation. And if by chance or by a deliberate decision, we take our hands out of his by sin after our baptism, he's able to take us up again by the hand and raise us up every time we go to confession. He shows us that there's nowhere that we could go that we could find ourselves in that's too far for him to reach to. There's no depth we could fall down into that he can't reach down and bring us up from. And then, like the little girl, he wants us to let him, 
take us to be fed, just as he does in the Holy Eucharist, where he feeds us with his own body and blood. Let him show you his tender love for you, no matter what's happened in your life, no matter where you are right now, no matter what sufferings you've experienced, no matter what wrongs we've done. Let him show you his compassion and the tenderness of his heart. Be a child again in his arms, and let him say to you too, Talitha kum, little girl, little boy, arise. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. God from God, right from light, true God from true God, begotten and made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the Lord and the Lord God, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us offer our prayers to our Heavenly Father. For the intentions of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Bishop David O'Connor, and for our priests and brothers, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the men and boys of our parish whom God is calling to be priests and brothers, especially in the Red Bank Oratory of St. Philip Neri, and for the women and girls whom God is calling to be sisters, that they have the courage to say yes to him, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Brother Zachary, Brother Anthony, and Brother James, who are in formation for the oratory, and for our diocesan seminarian, Brian, that the Lord give them the grace of joy and perseverance in their vocations, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For husbands and wives and widows and widowers, that they may lead their families to greater holiness and fidelity to Christ and his church. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For the poor, the sick, and those in need, that the Lord may inspire in us new ways of serving him in them. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For the deceased members of our families and parish, and for those who have no one to pray for them, that our prayers may accompany them as they are prepared for paradise. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the special intention of this Mass, for John Crodick and Sebastian Buffamante, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, in your kindness and mercy, 
We ask you to please hear and answer our prayers according to your will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Offertory Hymn can be heard. There is a second collection today for Peter's Pence. The Offertory Hymn can be found in your pew missile at number 206, O God Beyond All Praising. That's number 206. And at this time, we invite the children to bring their gifts to the altar. and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O God, who graciously accomplished the effects of your mysteries, grant we pray that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you so loved the world that in your mercy you sent us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, 
so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we have lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks as an exaltation we acclaim. created rightly gives you praise for through your son our lord jesus christ by the power and working of the holy spirit you give life to all things and make them holy and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name therefore o lord we humbly implore you by the same spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Therefore, Lord, 
Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the ablation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with our Holy Father, St. Philip Neri, St. Anthony of Padua, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and David, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and ever, and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you 
Communion Antiphon for this 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time can be found in your pew missile on page 215.
The communion hymn can be found in your pew missile at number 165, The Mortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. That's number 165. Sacrifice we have offered and received, fill us with light and the Lord we pray. To the balance of the last and charity, we may go through the last prayers. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
time, same place, July 7th, is the Mass of Thanksgiving at this Mass. It'll be with, uh, it's for the Pontifical Recognition of the Oratory, with our own Bishop David O'Connell, the Prior General from Rome, together with his secretary and the representative of the Pope from Canada is coming down, as well as a number of other kind of bishops. Uh, Mario Alvarez, the previous Prior General, is coming up from Texas to be a big celebration with a number of other priests who were influential and uh, supported us during that time. We want all of you to be there uh, to celebrate that day uh, with us. So next Sunday, at 10.30 a.m., you have one week left to change your plans. <laughs> okay? Um, right after, we'll be a reception in the gymnasium. Uh, so stay, stay afterwards after the Mass of Thanksgiving for that. And then because of the, um, the Mass will be a little bit longer than usual, we won't have the 12 o'clock Mass next Sunday. Uh, it will just be for next Sunday. That's the only Mass that we're not having next Sunday. It's just that Mass because of what is taking place uh, after 10.30 Mass. There are also no confessions at 10 a.m. or 11.30 or 1 p.m. because of all that stuff. The only confessions next Sunday are at 8.30 a.m. So if you need to go to confession at that time, the day before, the day, the day after. Uh, also that day, right when we finish partying for, for the reception, there's a Liberty Extravaganza at 3.30. After that, another barbecue party. So cut out the whole day, find a nice spot on the lawn, take a look at that, and then come back to the experience of having it. So that's all next, next stuff. So this Friday, this first Friday, adoration from 7 p.m. this Friday to 7 a.m. on Saturday. And then um, this past Friday, on June 28th, Brother James received his habit and began his conviction. So he looks nice, right? Hello everyone, my name is Nico, and I'm going to tell you guys why you should come to Youth, Junior, and Children's Oratory. So everybody knows how the priests give a real life connection to um, the topic of the Mass, right? Okay, good. Well for Oratory, we play games that are related to a topic for a deeper understanding. Also we will have time for prayer and some snacks. Believe me when I say this, but I have came to oratory for a long time and I had a blast. If you guys are interested, why don't you come tonight and check it out. If you want, bring a friend or two. Oratory is 7 to 8.30 p.m. I hope to see all of you guys there. Thank you. because I have a lot of fun. We play games and meet new friends. And it helps me grow closer to God. We pray and do benediction at the very end of each night. We also sing songs and sometimes watch Ryan DeFrady. And one, one fun activity on a Sunday evening was when Brother Anthony wrote letters like St. Paul, and we did a scavenger hunt. And plus, if you go to 6 p.m. Mass, you're already there for youth group. I hope, I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. 
output would be nice to watch it up. Oh. And everyone can You don't get a big yes for that. There's very good. You know, many God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. The recessional hymn can be found in your pew missile at number 197. Now thank we all our God. That's number 197.